Good morning. Indian preachers are uh, so well known for preaching three hours minimum. <laughs> An Indian preacher, uh, he was asked to preach uh, uh, in a church, and that was not in India. And the preacher went and asked the pastor, Pastor, how long I could take? The pastor looked at him and said, you take as long as you want. <laughs> the pastor was, uh, the preacher was very happy. And after a pause, <clears throat> the pastor of the church said, you know, but my people, after 20 minutes, they will sleep. After 20 minutes, they will sleep, he said. Okay, I'm sure that you will not sleep. <laughs> I also give you guarantee I would not let you sleep, okay? Okay, <laughs> this morning, I have a title. This is what uh, title I have uh, chosen for my preaching. Persuasion versus dissuasion, battle in discipleship journey. I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with uh, this word, dissuasion. Okay, persuasion is just moving forward, no matter the struggles, no matter challenges, but moving forward. And uh, dissuasion is being sidetracked. So the focus is lost. The purpose is lost. And these two or two elements always wrestle against each other. And this is my life. What I'm going to share is my life. And perhaps this is your life. And if you just look at my topic, it says battle in discipleship journey. I want, uh, I want to give some more information on the word disciple. Very sorry to say this is uh, a forgotten word today in Christian churches and missions. In fact, uh, the Great Commission is make disciples. The word mission, what we use, derived ultimately from a Latin word. We don't see that word mission directly anywhere in the Bible. I don't mean that they should not be mission. Please do not misunderstand me. And the word conversion, which in my country often people they speak about, we don't see even that word. All that Bible says is make disciples, which means that word discipleship is such a comprehensive word that includes everything that we do today. But make disciples. Okay, why that word is so significant? Because the word itself. There are two implications we see and the third one is the result of two implications the meaning of the word the in greek which primarily means a follower and secondarily it means learner so a disciple is someone who follows and who learns together so learning in following. Learning tells us we are prone to commit mistakes because we are learners. I still remember how many people I chased on the street when I was learning driving first time. <laughs> and on the other side, we are followers because we have someone to follow. And so one day, I will be like him. Because the one who goes ahead, the one that I follow, is the strongest one I could imagine. I'm weak, but I can accomplish it. Put together, and that's what discipleship. Learning and following. 
Okay, what's the, what's the outcome of learning and following? Very simple. I will become like him. Like the one I follow. And that's what we, we call ourselves Christians. Okay, Christians is a synonym to the word disciples. You read, first time when people were called disciples in the city of Antioch, the Bible very clearly says they were disciples. Disciples were called Christians. So which means if you are a Christian, non-negotiably, you must be a disciple. It's a non-negotiable emphasis we see in the Bible. Again, my friends, it's a journey. You cannot be mature in one day saying, I follow Jesus. Oh, no, you cannot. It's a journey. It's a journey. As we are in the journey, the question comes here, are you going to yield to dissuasions or are you going to persuade? And that's why I, I, I titled this in this way, Persuasion versus Dissuasion. Battle in Discipleship Journey. And I could not uh, see any other ideal example in the scriptures other than Paul for my argument. I was talking with Pastor David and I understood you're all well tuned with uh, expository preaching. But today I'm not going to take one passage and expose. Rather, I'm going to, I'm going to take uh, several uh, fragments of Book of Acts and put them together and try to expose the truth this morning that all of us will be benefited through the Spirit of the Holy God. The first thing I want to just uh, bring before you, how did God set a good discipleship journey for Paul. There are a few references I want to bring before you. This is uh, Book of Acts chapter 9, verse 15. This is God speaking to Ananias, the one who was uh, uh, speaking on behalf of God to Paul after his conversion. It goes in this way. But the Lord said to him, Go for he is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. If you think deeply, Paul at this stage was a clueless follower. All that he knew was he saw bright light. That's it. And, uh, and that light began to speak to him. He said, who are you, Lord? The light said, I'm Jesus, the one you've been persecuting. How was that? And the next question, okay, Lord, what, what do you want me to do? So he was totally clueless. But the journey started. And God says... He has to take my name. So which means he's going to be my ambassador to the Gentiles at large. That is in reference to Acts 1.8. Not only in Jerusalem, but also Samaria, Judea, and to the uttermost part of the world, and you shall be my witnesses. You know, Paul is part of that. And you will suffer. Again, you will suffer. It's a journey. And you will suffer. But you will take my name. So that's the beginning we see here. Chapter 20 and verse 24. And here now Paul is uh, speaking to the Sanhedrin before the Jews and uh, and other, other uh, religious leaders. And there he says, but I do not account of my life. You know, he's, he's rephrasing his testimony. But I do not account my life of any value, nor as 
precious to myself. If only I may finish my course and the ministry that I received from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. God wanted him to testify the gospel of the grace of God. So that's, that's God's set journey for Paul. Acts 22, verse 21, if you read. Again, here God speaks to him, and uh, he, he rewrites here. And he said to me, go, for I will send you far away to the Gentiles. God said, go far away for my sake to the Gentiles. Chapter 23, verse 11. The following night, the Lord stood by him and said, Take courage, for as you have testified to the facts about me in Jerusalem, so you must testify also in Rome. Okay, if you put all of these things together, you know, we understand one thing. God set a journey, and it, it began on one particular day, and Paul was a clueless disciple. And God wanted him to pass through, and as he was passing through, he should remain a progressive testimony, and eventually he would become like Christ. So clueless disciple, God wanted him to be like Christ-like. A long journey, and God set for Paul. So now, how, how, how does Paul do? See, God sets, and then, you know, he gives... Uh, he gives absolute freedom to us, okay? So this is God's and uh, this is yours. Of course, we believe the sovereignty hand of God, sovereign hand of God here. You cannot resist against him, no question about it. But still, he gives freedom to us to do whatever we like. And there comes the dissuasion. Seldom we see people set precisely the way that God sets. Well, I did not do that, okay? There were a few occasions I began to set my own because of various dissuasions in my life. But sovereign hand of God pulled me back again, said, hey, listen, do this. Okay, this is what I want you to do. I did it. I repented. I did it. So I reset myself. But here, when you look at Paul, Paul was setting precisely the way God set his life. Some of the verses I want to just bring before you here, just look at here. Chapter 19, book of Acts, verse 21. Paul says this. Now after these events, Paul resolved in the spirit to pass through Macedonia and Achaia and go to Jerusalem, saying, after I have been there, I must also see Rome. You know, the context here is, Paul was in Ephesus now, and uh, probably he had stayed there for three years and more, and he well established a wonderful church, a good church, and people, they loved him, and he loved the people, and a remarkable, a remarkable growth. We read about the church in various other uh, extra biblical books. Good book, a uh, good church, and he well planted, but he was wanting to go. It's not easy, my friends. After, after working so hard and, and after planting such a wonderful church, getting out. Getting out for what? Getting out to go to Jerusalem and then to Rome. Again, this is very interesting note with the observation. When Paul had done his first mission trip, he started from Antioch and he went and he did excellent ministry and he came back again reported in, uh, in, in the church of Antioch. So Antioch was his hub. And then the second mission again he does, and he comes back, again he reports. And apparently third mission also, he left from Antioch, and he should come back again to Antioch and report, but he says, I'm not going to Antioch, I'm going to Jerusalem straight. Okay, Paul knew that his days have come to end. 
and he and 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 he knew this is what God said. God said, "I will I will go and testify to the kings, to the Gentiles, and uh, to the Israel." To some extent, I have done the third part, and now I have to go and meet the kings. I have to go and meet the Gentile world. That part is yet to be done fully. So let me go to Jerusalem. And then says, I'll go to Rome, not to Antioch. Because that is God's set journey for me. <coughs> you know, if you read... Um, Acts 9, 5, which I said earlier, and then again 22, 10 I read, and come to 26, 19 here, he was, he was speaking before Agrippa, and there he says, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision. How? What is that heavenly vision? That heavenly vision is, you will suffer. You will suffer. He says, I was not disobedient. But declared first to those in Damascus, then in Jerusalem, and through all out region of Judea, and also to the Gentiles, that they should repent and turn to. And then he says, take me to Caesar. I want to go to Rome. Because that was set by God. Romans chapter 1, verse 11. This is epistle. He wrote apparently from Corinth. And uh, this fits in historically uh, somewhere between, somewhere in chapter 18 of book of Acts. There he says, for long I see you, for I long to see you, that I may impart to, impart to you some spiritual gift to strengthen you. He says, I want to come to Rome. Oh, he was in Corinth. So I strongly believe when he was in Corinth itself, the spirit began to tell him, you have to go to Rome. This is my plan for you. And he was willing to go. Acts 20, 22. And now behold, I'm going to Jerusalem, constrained by the spirit, not knowing what will happen to me there, except the Holy Spirit testifies to me in every city that imprisonment and afflictions a white me. Oh, I wish I should have that kind of determination, my friends, to, 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 to adhere to the set journey of God for my life. I want to bring uh, two obvious traps now in Paul's journey. Two obvious traps of dissuasion. These, these two could have been uh, a, a, a trap in his life, but he did not. I want to just bring before you. The first one in chapter 21, we see after his uh, stay in Miletus, he was wanting to move forward. And then eventually we see some disciples, they come and speak to him. And having sought out the disciples, we stayed there for seven days, and through the Spirit, they, that is the disciples, through the Spirit, they were telling Paul not to go on to Jerusalem. Okay, this is, this is God's third journey, and Paul, you know, precisely setting his journey as it was set by God, and in between now, the disciples, uh, disciples, they come and speak to him. They are not, they are not uh, heathens, okay? They are children of God. They are like him. They come and say, Paul, you know, when you go to Jerusalem, you have troubles there, okay? You have problems there. You have issues there. Don't go. Don't go. And we see again, there one more here. Chapter 21, verse 10. While we were staying for many days, a prophet named Agabus came down from Judea. He came all the way from Judea to see Paul here to communicate 
the prophetical message. And coming to us, he took Paul's belt and bound his own feet and hands and said, Thus says the Holy Spirit, this is how the Jews at Jerusalem will bind the man who owns this belt and deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. When we heard this, we and the people there urged Paul not to go to, go to Jerusalem. A very obvious disobedience. He could have said, our disciples, you love me so much. Yeah, you're right. I'm not going to go to Jerusalem. Agabus, you man of God, you are a prophet. You came all the way from Judea to warn this. You're right. I'm not going. He could have said two obvious dissuasions. Now let's go and see the way that Paul responded to that. And now Paul's response is what uh, a reflection of his persuasion. Okay, he says, chapter 21, verse 13. What are you doing? You, my friends, prophet, what are you doing? Weeping and breaking my heart. For I'm ready not only to be imprisoned and suffer, but even to die in Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Ha. Huh. No, no compromise, no dilution, no side tracks, no excuses. This is God. This is his journey. This is my journey set. No compromise whatsoever. I'm going. I'm going. So now the disciples, they came and said this to him. Verse 21, ch chapter 21, verse 14. And since he would not be persuaded, since Paul would not be persuaded, we seized and said, let the will of the Lord be done. And this is what the wrestling between persuasion and dissuasion in the journey of every disciple, my friends. There are many, uh, many other unobvious dissuasions I also see here. Okay, this is, this is Paul's third mission trip. You know, you could uh, just see even in your Bibles. And it's very interesting observation here. If, you know, if you had read Book of Acts historically, you know, up to uh, chapter 19, you know, we read about many events and few names. And we do not read much about uh, the geographical details. But when you come to chapter 20 and onward, the geographical details are more than the rest of the chapters. No, we believe that every word is God's intended word for us. And every word is infallible, which means there is something that I should adopt for my faith and practice. We cannot ignore anything. So when the Holy Spirit added, these names, geographical names and regions and, and the po name of the ports and then the time that he stayed and who came and met, I mean, they are irrelevant to, to the whole narration. Most of them are irrelevant. But God wanted us to read. Why? These are all the hidden truths, I would say. Some of the, some of the uh, names, uh, some of the places... I have circled here. The other places, you know, Luke mentions in, in his writing in the chapter 21. I want to just bring quickly uh, each of them, okay? Kos and uh, Rhodes and Petara, Cyprus, Phoenicia, and Tyre. Okay, each of them are very attractive in one sense. Okay, Kos is a mountainous island with ridges extending to a height of 2,500 feet, which means it's, it's a like a smoky mountain in that, in that region. Okay? You can go and rest. And Paul was passing through. Just imagine, the journey was set with full of sufferings and predicted you will have more suffering. Now he's passing through, and he comes and he sees a place. Ah, here. Uh, can I go and stay there for another 15, 20 days and rest for some time and then proceed? 
I think Holy Spirit would have agreed, but Paul does not want to do that. And so also each of those, places, no, I have given a few samples. If you read those geographical names and go back to the dictionary and read, okay, the kind of attractions he had, he could have given a beautiful reason. He could have justified, God, I want to have some rest here. I want to have some, some, some peaceful days here. You know, some retreating. He did not do. Rather, the whole chapter 21 says, you know, Paul was rushing. He set, he journeyed, he set, he set, he set, he sailed. Oh, it's a kind of lust for suffering. Sorry, I'm using a different kind of phrase here, okay? Lust for suffering. Okay, these are all unobvious traps of dissuasions we see in Acts 21, my friends. I want to just bring a few causes in my observation from Book of Acts and other, other writings of Paul. Causes for this persuasion of Paul. What are the causes? The first one is his unshakable belief in God's word. What God said in chapter 9, 15, and 16. This is what my will for you. This is my journey. This is word of God. This is from God. Who are you, Jesus? I'm the one who is speaking to you. This is what you should do. Okay. It's non-negotiable. Non-compromisable. This is single objective in my life because this is God's word. Belief in God's word. In his direction, whatever God gives, that's my life direction. In his commissioning, in his promise, and in his presence, and in his power. It's not just God's word. God's word gives him direction. He holds on to that. And God's word said you are commissioned, you are set apart, and he believed it. And God said, I will be with you. He believed it, and he recognized God's presence all the time, and that led him even to worship the Lord when he was in Caesarea jail. And his power was all sufficient for him. Belief in God's word, that was the key reason for his persuasion. The second one is passion for the mission of God. You know, I have called you to take my name to these people. So beautifully he says in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 15, he says, Woe unto me if I do not preach the gospel. I am compelled to preach the gospel. Woe unto me if I do not preach the gospel. Such a remarkable, outstanding passion for God's mission. The third one is setting kingdom values as we read in Colossians chapter 1, chapter 3, verses 1 to 3. You know, set your mind on the things high above. A day will come, the king will come and you will come with him. A day will come, the king will come and you will come with him. So set your hearts on things high above, not on the things of this world. My friends, these are all the three reasons. Belief in God's word, passion for God's mission, setting kingdom values, that made him not to be dissuaded. Not to be dissuaded. I want to ask you a question. You have been a Christian. I do not know how long you have been a Christian. I, I would prefer the word disciple to be substituted in every word that we use, Christians. So don't, don't consider you are a Christian, you are a disciple. God has called you. God has cleansed you. And God wants you to be like Christ. This is your journey. You cannot be on one day because you are so vulnerable. I'm so vulnerable. We are sinnable. So we cannot be. But we must pass through the journey and so that one day... We will become like Christ. 
And that one day certainly cannot be here on this earth. And when we meet the Lord Jesus, we will be like him. Romans 8 confirms that. We will be given, we will attain the image of the Son day. It's a journey, my friends. I want to ask you a question. How are you? Are you persuading like Paul? Or for some reasons, you're being dissuaded? I do not know because I'm not an American. I, you know, I married an Indian lady. I'm very happy with her. Okay, I do not know about your contractual challenges which might uh, dissuade you. I do not know. But Bible speaks very common dissuasions and I want to just bring before you. The first one we read in 1 Timothy chapter 4 verse 1. Now, the spirit of expressly says that in later times some will depart from the faith by devoting themselves to deceitful spirits and teaching teachings of demons see this is one common dissuasion attraction toward ungodly deceptions and teachings this is quite well happening in my country okay come and accept jesus you will, become, you will become the richest man in the world. You know, many, they run behind Jesus. There are many deceptive teachings. I don't know. That could be one of the dissuasions you have been right now wrestling. Here is the truth, well taught, spoken. Here, deception. They have fabricated attractions around it. up to you. The second uh, common dissuasion the word of God says in Hebrews chapter 3 verse 2 uh, verse 12. Take care brothers lest there be in any of you an evil unbelieving heart leading you to fall away from the living God. Unbelieving heart. That's the second dissuasion. There was a centurion uh, I think he was a centurion you know, he, he just came before the Lord Jesus Christ and he made a beautiful prayer, which was very powerful interaction of the Spirit one day when I was meditating early in the morning. He said this, God, my, my daughter is, is sick. You know, the Lord said, you have to believe me. He said, I believe you, but take away my unbelief. I believe you, which means, you know, it's like, you know, I believe you, I don't believe you, I believe you, I don't believe you. Okay, that's a dissuasion. That could be. I don't know. This is common dissuasion. Bible wants us. The fourth one is in book of Revelation, chapter 2, verse 4 says, But I have this against you, that you have abandoned the love you had at first. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen. Making God substitutes. That's what here the Spirit tells me. Making God substitutes, okay? Oh, Samson was uh, led by the Spirit from his birth. Okay, he was an excellent man of God. And for some time, he made Delilah to be his God. In Ananias and Sapphira, they were so faithful people in the church. And for some time, they made money. They made wealth to be their God. God substitutes. That's the third common persuasion we have my friends second corinthians chapter 11 verse 3 but i'm afraid that as the serpent deceived eve by his cunning your thoughts will be led astray from a sincere and pure devotion to christ okay regression regressing devotion to god you know you know it's like it's like uh, you know the lord said to joshua you know, think always, think always, you know. Uh, let not this word depart from you at any time. Okay, that's what total devotion. And sometimes, you know, the fear of the future and uh, various issues and challenges that we come across, you know, it would strongly sometimes extract that devotion. A partial devotion to God is no devotion to God. 
God wants us fully to progress in that area. Regressing devotion to God is one of the common traps the Bible wants us. And the last one here, James 1.12. Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial. For when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. Life trials. Life trials. I want to just say a real story here and close my thoughts this morning to you. Years ago, when I was a new believer, there was a man of God, excellent, uh, excellent servant, and he was working among the young people in the city called Chennai, Madras then. And he was one of my superheroes when I was a new believer. And one fine day, he left for U.S. from India. He had some meetings, I don't remember. He was young. He was then 36 or 37. He came here, and that was the last journey. He had a massive heart attack, and he passed away in this country. And it's a long story. Having four children, it's all newborn, you know. It's all like, uh, not newborn, very young, like, Four years and three years, two years, and newly born. Just imagine a widow mother keeping these four and unexpected sudden death. The funeral was happening. There was a huge crowd. And many of us, we had this question, God, why did he do this? What way this man did commit any sin? Why did this happen? And most of us, we were very furious toward God. I was very angry with God. God, why did you do this? And our funeral service go, uh, our funeral services go with a uh, bit, you know, uh, spiritual flavors or more on, on that. So before uh, laying his body into the pit, and uh, the pastor said, there anyone who want here who, who is wanting to give thanks to the Lord and pray? And there, there was nobody wanting to pray, giving thanks, because everyone was so angry with God. Okay, God, why did you do this? And I was so surprised because his wife, suddenly she knelt down. And she raised her hands, said, God, I thank you, I praise you because of this man you have given to me. Thank you for using him. Thank you for the lives that have been changed by this man. I give you glory and honor. A young widow with four children, she raised her hands and prayed. When trials come, we disobeyed. I do not know, my friends. All that I want to tell you is this. You are in a journey. You have wrestling. Persuasion and dissolution. The whole idea of Book of Acts is this. You will receive power to tell us this is what. You will receive power. That power is not a power that makes you to jump from one corner to the other. That's not the power that makes us to do some gymnastic. Please do not misunderstand me. That power is power which would make like Paul. You will receive the power and you shall be my witnesses. The missing element today in the world is witnesses. Because people expected to be witnesses, many of them are dissuaded by various traps in their journey. May God give us strength, power of the Holy Spirit, and so we'll continue to run the race as Paul concluded, I have finished my race. I have finished my race. I knew the race was set for me when I met the Lord in Tarsus. Now I finish my race in Rome. Praise be to the Lord. Shall we look to him in prayer? Our Father, we thank you for the word, precious word, the word which speaks always to us. God, we want to acknowledge we are so simple people, vulnerable people, 
We are people of fragility. Life issues, challenges, when they come and attack us. Lord, we fail to persuade. We are not like Apostle Paul oftentimes. But Lord, this morning, this, ap- this noon, we recognize that you died on the cross for us. So that, Lord, weak people like us be made stronger. So we look above and we ask you to forgive us from all our failures, Lord. And Lord, we ask your spirit be granted to us and so that, Lord, we will continue to run the race with persuasion. When we meet you, Lord, we want your very special touch on us because of our successful journey on this earth. We give you thanks, praise, glory. In Jesus' name, amen.